Thanks, mate. Mm. Can I take a moment just to look out amongst you? It's been quite special for me just to spend this morning with you. I was here earlier just watching people arrive, practice, set up, pray together, talk, engage, and just sensing the Spirit of God amongst all of that. There's something really beautiful happening here amongst you. There's a gift of God's presence. And God's presence is not something that we can take for granted. It's something that he wants us to walk in and hold in a way that is transferable. It passes on. It's not just contained within these walls. And so when we come to here today, and it's gonna be a bit of a, a message all over the place. They, they say a pastor's number one fear is they won't have enough to say. And the congregation's number one fear is they'll have too much to say. Well, I feel like I've got too much to say today, so God help us all. <laughs> um, I'll, try, I'll try and keep on track and, and, and what will help me is three scriptures. We're gonna look at three encounters today. One of them, the last one that we're gonna look at was already read. We're gonna look at another two. But before we begin, there's a quote from A.W. Tozer, and we'll just go up now, that has stuck with me for a long, long time because of the importance of what it communicates. What comes to mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What you and I believe about God and what we hold as a belief about God and more importantly, not just what we believe here, but what has taken root in our heart will influence every thought, decision, response. And so whenever we open God's word, it'll come through that filter. And that filter may hopefully is challenged over the years, but we have to understand it will come through that filter. And one of the filters that we could grow up with, I certainly grew up with this, was that God was a distant God. I haven't sensed it here at all. I don't have to tell you stuff about this because you already know it. But I wanna share something with you around that um, in order to affirm and encourage how important that is. I grew up in a really faithful church that taught the Bible really well. But I also grew up thinking that God was a distant God and an impersonal God. I had a very good, as I said, a very good foundation of the word of God, but it was at a distance. And I kind of saw God as a grandfather figure. I didn't have, one of my grandfathers I never met because he died before I knew him and the other one lived a long way away. And so as I thought about it afterwards that I've got a grandfather figure, it's this distant figure of God. That each time I did something wrong, he was there with a big stick in the sky to beat me up. And as a, as a young, in my teenage years, as I was wrestling and coming back, and coming back to a, a deeper awareness of who God is, he spoke to me in my spirit. And at the time, I didn't really know, is this God, is this not God? And I come back from soccer training and my, my cousin was there and her niece, my, her daughter was there and she was three years old and it was time for her to go to bed. And I said to Vicky, if you like, I'll read Crystal a story and I'll put her to bed for you. And I picked this little girl up and I put her on my hip to carry her to the bed, to mum and dad's bed. And I had this love filled my heart that I've never felt before. It was the most purest form of love. It was, as we know, unconditional, as we know as a parent, that that sense of love that you have the first time you see your kid and you just, you wanna give. There's this overwhelming sense of delight and love. And as I'm feeling that love, God spoke in my spirit and said, Phil, that's how I feel about you. And it was almost too good to be true. And I went, my whole sense of God in that moment was beginning to be transformed. 
And I walked Crystal to the bed and I put her down on the bed beside her and we had our backs up against the wall and she was sitting beside me and I started reading her a story. And as I'm reading the story, she just snuggled her heart, her head into my heart. And I felt this sense of completion of love, that she was now encircled in that love, not separated from it, but encircled within it and the completion of that love. And as I'm feeling that love, again, this voice speaks into my spirit, Phil, that's how I feel about you when you sit with me, when you you draw near to me. And like a normal three-year-old, that lasted for about 30 seconds. And then she's up jumping down on the bed. And again, I I, kind of felt like, well, I'm going to feel anger here, but I didn't feel anger. What I felt was grief a longing that she was missing out on something that we had experienced together and I began to see God not as a God with a stick in the sky ready to beat me but a God who longs for who grieves for that separation and will do anything as we just saw in communion to make a way back where I can sit with my head on his heart And I share that story because that story has been a foundational understanding of how I see God. He is so much more than that. But there's something as we come to the listening prayer and we look at some of these things that I want want us to to see that in in the light of some of those things. The first story we're going to look at um, under the heading of hearing the voice of God is Samuel. I want to read it to you. If you want to follow on, it's from 1 Samuel chapter 3. But maybe you want to just close your eyes. And I want you, as I'm reading it, I want you just to to let God's Spirit speak to you. What are the words that jump out to you from this particular story? What does this story reveal to you of God's heart to be heard? Of where the people are at in the story? So let's read it together. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At the time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim, and so he could not see. Let me just stop there for a minute. We already see the context of the culture and the state of the nation. Eli's sons, if we had read earlier, it says of Eli's sons, they had no regard for God. And when God speaks to Eli about his sons, he says, you honour your sons more than you honour me. And in that context, is it any wonder that the voice of the God, the voice of the Lord was rare? You see, if we have hearts that aren't Um, regarding God and his word to us as holy, as more important than any other voice in our life, then why would we ever hear God's voice? It would just be crowded out amongst all the other noises that are around us. Eli was lying down in his own place. The lamp of the Lord had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark was. What a significant place to be laying down. The ark in the temple, right next to where the presence of God resided. And the Lord called Samuel and said, and he said, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I didn't call you. Go lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But he said, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. What a sad thought that here he is ministering in the temple and no one around him had revealed the Lord, the word of the Lord 
to him. They just went about their religious duties with no desire to hear from God and they passed on their ignorance or their lack of knowledge to a generation. And the Lord called Samuel again a third time. He arose and he went to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Three times it took for the priests to understand this is the voice of God. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, go lie down and if he calls you, you shall say, speak Lord for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place and the Lord came and stood calling as the other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak for your servant hears. What a beautiful picture of how God longs to speak to us personally. And amongst all of that beautiful picture is this backstory going on where there's a whole nation of people who are disinterested, who have no regard for God or his word. But God chooses a little boy and he speaks to that little boy. And I go, where are the Samuels today? There's Samuels sitting in this building right now who God wants to speak to. And there is a church community around them who God wants us as a church to nurture his word in and amongst our children. That our children would not be a generation that grows up where the word of God is scarce, but they would grow up where they know the word of God. And the word of God is in them and is part of them. Samuel went on from that as a boy, he became a prophet and he ushered in the true Israel kingdom when God anointed him to go and choose the next king after the people's king, Saul, that they chose, was no longer fit to be king. And it says of Samuel, because he had been a, as a boy knowing and hearing the word of the Lord, he looked at people differently. He didn't look through human eyes. Jesse brought out all of his sons and all of them stood before Samuel and he rejected all of them. Yet they were impressive through human eyes. And he brings out the ruddy youngest David and he looks at him and he says, that's the king. Because man is impressed with the outer appearance but God looks at the heart. When we disregard God's word, we put ourselves at the center of our world. But when we regard God's word and we long to hear him speak to us, we shift out of the center and he begins to reside in that place. And then everything else shifts in our life because of that. Where are the Samuels today? Where are the ones that are hungering and listening for the voice of God? I remember as a teenager going to a Christian musical festival called Black Stump. If you, in my era, in the early 80s, you might have heard of something like that. And I was in Canada, a preacher there called John Smith. Most of you may have heard of John Smith from the God Squad. And I came back, came back from that time away and I was lying in my bed that night about to go to sleep and this is the first time I ever had a sense of God speaking to me and he said to me one day you'll do that what John did and it was so foreign to me that it went in one ear and out the other and I never remembered it until I was at Bible college about two or three years in the Bible college and I was wanting to quit and God took me back to that time. And he kept it all that time to affirm over me in that moment. 
But way back then, God was speaking to me and he held me. There's a call for all of us to be nurturing the next generation that they be brought up to hear the voice of the voice of the Lord. Let's look at the next one, Philip. It was read to us in the prayer time this morning. So let's read it together now. And again, I invite you just to be listening for the words that God might speak to you. And the context as I read this scripture, the context of it is that persecution's broken out. Philip's run from Jerusalem. He's ended up in Samaria and God is just taking off in this place. A little mini revival's happening in Samaria. And right in the middle of this little mini revival that's taking place, we pick it, pick it up. And the angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Essentially, Philip, I'm gonna take you out of where all the action is and I'm gonna take you into a desert place. Doesn't make sense. So he started out and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of the treasury in Kathaki, which means queen of the Ethiopians. The man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his, he was on his way home and he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah. The spirit told Philip, go to the chariot and stand near it. Then Philip ran to the chariot and heard the man reading the book of Isaiah from the, from the prophet Isaiah. And Philip, I, I, I love this, Philip got close enough to the man that he could hear what God was speaking to him. But not too close that he imposed himself on the man. When you think about that for a moment, that's how God speaks to us or longs to speak to us that we get close enough to him that we hear him. But he never imposes himself on us. He gives us the freedom in that moment to draw closer, to invite us, be invite closer, or to pull away. And in this moment, the Ethiopian eunuch invited Philip closer. And he asked and he invited him up onto the chariot and Philip started where he started where the God, where God was with the man. Do you understand what you were reading, Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And this passage, in this passage, this is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb is silent before the shearer, so did he not open his mouth. In humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And Philip began with the very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stop stand in the way of me being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. And then Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but he went on rejoicing. What do we do when the voice of God speaks to us? in ways that take us outside of our normal human wisdom or outside of our normal desires? Do we honour that word or do we honour our wisdom? Do we honour what other people are doing around us or where, the, or where the action is? Or can we trust God's word enough? You know that Philip didn't even know he had a destination but he didn't know why he was going there. Philip never even went to that destination. If it was all about the destination, he would have walked straight past the Ethiopian eunuch. He was in the presence of God and he had a hunger to stay in the presence of God and hear his voice. And he was sensitive enough in that moment as he's walking that lonely desert road 
to a destination that he doesn't know what he's going for, that he realises in this moment, this is the presence of God moment. And he hears the Holy Spirit speak to him, go stand a little bit closer. Close enough that you can hear my voice. Close enough that you can help him connect the dots between the fact that I'm not a distant God. I'm very present and very personal. And I want, I want to take that, that message back to where the Ethiopian was going. We don't know what fruit came of that single seed that was sown that day. Are we willing to listen to God's voice over conventional wisdom and the economy of this world? There's no economy of taking a man where all the action is and putting him in the desert. There's no economy in that. It doesn't make sense. But something happened in that moment that can only happen by God. Here's the challenge for us in this day of our church. I, I know churchmanship. I know how to do church. You all know how to do church. But that's not what God wants us to know. He wants us to know him. He wants us to know his intimate, personal word to us. Our future as a church is not in our churchmanship, how well we do things. Our future is in hearing the voice of God and listening to the voice of God and walking in the voice of God, the words that he gives us, even when that goes against what our human wisdom might say, to trust in his word at that moment. And finally, the last story was read to us, the voice of Peter. What do we do when the voice of God goes against everything we have believed and the cultural values that we have held on to for so long? That's what Peter was faced with. He's got this dream he doesn't know what to do with because in this dream, God is speaking to him about stuff that he's brought up his whole life to believe and do and act upon. And God is speaking, suddenly speaking a word that is putting all of that into question. What do we do when we face that? Do we just hold on to what we have and just dismiss it? Are we open enough to hear God's word and let that word challenge us? As we look through that, we won't go read it again, but as we look through that, there's some things that I learned from Peter in that moment. There's things that were consistent for Peter in the ways that God had spoken to him before. Things like the fact that three times God spoke the vision to him and three times in Peter's own journey he denied Christ. Three times Jesus had affirmed Peter. And there's things in our story that as we go along in life that we begin to know the character and the nature of God and how he deals with us so that we begin to know his voice when he's speaking to us. And no doubt for Peter there was a familiarity in that. All the time they were walking and they were walking in Gentile territory, on the, on the edge of Gentile territory and they meet a woman from Canaanite, Can, Canaanite woman, unclean. And Jesus, even in that encounter, calls her a dog because that's what they were called in their days. But even though he calls her a dog, he's waiting for the disciples to see, is that how you really feel about her? We've just had an encounter with the religious leaders who are going off at us because we're not washing our hands properly. We're unclean because we're not washing our hands properly. But here we have a woman whose daughter is in desperate for a desperate mercy for her daughter. How are you going to look upon this woman? Is she unclean? Or is she worthy of respect and dignity? Does she, is she loved by God? Is God's love big enough to encompass her? I wonder if Peter is going back to that moment and rethinking how Jesus dealt with this woman. And the story ends with Jesus saying to her and only one other person who happened to be a Gentile, your great faith has healed you. Not faith, your great faith has healed you. Jesus in that moment had honoured this woman. I wonder whether Peter is going back to that as he wrestles with, what is God saying to me in this story? 
Do you know in that moment, God's word will be, never be less than what it is. It will always be more. Jesus said, I haven't come to pull down the law, demolish it. I've come to fulfill it. So in that moment where we're wrestling whether we're hearing God's voice or not, we can know that if it's God's voice, it will never be less than his word. It will be more. It will be consistent with Jesus and how he lived. You know, there's a courage that I admire of Peter in that moment that unlocked the whole Gentile world. He could have shut it right down. But there's a courage for him to trust in the word of God in that moment. I don't know, how, I don't know if you realise how difficult that is. <laughs> there are things that you and I hold on to that are values that we think are values of God, but they're not. They're values that we've made around God. And the challenge for all of us as we go forward and as God is rebirthing his church because that's what he's doing. The challenge for us is what are we going to let go of in order to embrace something more godly? Not less, more godly. Jesus said this about himself. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. And the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name, by name, and he leads them out. He goes ahead of them and his sheep follow because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they'll run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. What a beautiful invitation for all of us. For God to become the centre of our life. For us to learn to be present with God. As we listen to God, we learn to be present with God. We learn to be present with those around us. We learn to live lightly and generously and our kingdom shifts from a kingdom of this world to an eternal kingdom perspective. We experience freedom and joy, life and fruitfulness. I often think of Philip, if he just had it, gone, no, Holy Spirit, you don't understand. This is where it's all happening. Nothing would have come of the rest of that story. He invites us into freedom. We don't have to do it this way. We don't have to be hold on to these things that are, that are no longer relevant or working for us. And I'm not talking about changing for the change of sake. I'm talking about listening to the Spirit of God and obeying the Spirit of God. We have an invitation to live intimately with the Good Shepherd. To be courageous as we interact with the Good Shepherd and hear his voice. I want to just pray for us now and um, I want to pray a prayer that Jesus, is not a prayer that Jesus prayed, it's very similar to what was just read to us this morning from John 14 but it's from John 16 and it's Jesus preparing his disciples for his departure but I want to read what he spoke to them as a prayer for us and so if you want to join with me now as we just let God's word be a prayer over our life. And Jesus speaking to his disciples said, there's so much more I would like to say to you. But it's more than you can grasp at the moment. God just wants us to respond to that voice that is present with us now. Not any other voice, just the one that's before us now. But when the truth giving spirit comes, 
He'll unveil the reality of every truth and he'll deposit it within you. He won't speak his own message, but only what he hears from the Father. And he will reveal prophetically to you what is to come. He will glorify me on earth, for he will receive from me what is mine and he will reveal it to you. Everything that belongs to the Father belongs to me. That's why I say that the divine encourager will receive what is mine and reveal it to you. Father, we come, all of us come with our own understanding of who you are. Formed by scriptures, formed by encounters, formed by other people around us. But God, we wanna come to you now with open minds to the spirit of God and the revelation that he wants to bring into our minds, a renewing of our minds, a renewing of our spirit, that we might begin to see through your eyes more clearly. That our lives begin to more align with your word. And I wanna pray for this beautiful church, this church who knows you and loves you, this church who has a heart to walk near you and walk alongside of you. I wanna pray that your presence that is, ob is obvious here, that your presence would continue as the Holy Spirit is talked about here, continue to re reveal the Father, reveal the Son, glorify you, that courage and joy and freedom would be part of their countenance as they live and love and serve you. I thank you in Jesus' name, amen.